Hello everybody and welcome back to our research methods section. Um, we're talking in this section about kind of science and logic and why we do research methods. And really research methods is just a systematic method to answer questions. We have all these questions, we have all these cognitive biases, there are all these logical fallacies, and research methods provides us a way to minimize those and answer questions that have the highest chance of getting us the true, correct, reality-based answer, right? And the basic process there, which we're going to talk about this in a later section, is to gather data, analyze it, and make conclusions. And in each one of those three major steps, there's going to be lots of chances for uh, either random error or systematic error, uh, biases, um, inaccurate connections, etc. So we really, really, really need to be careful. Um, and importantly, these techniques and the stuff you're going to learn in this class is both for production and consumption. Once again, most of you will probably never end up becoming researchers. And that's okay. Um, but everybody, every single person watching this video will eventually become a consumer of research. And you need to know how research works so that you can become a more informed consumer of scientific knowledge, scientific reporting, um, know what constitutes good research and bad research, etc., etc. Now, you can divide research up into many different kinds of categories, right? And one way to divide those up is by kind of the, the goals of the research. And many textbooks, many research methods course um, will divide this into three, but I learned to divide it into four. <clears throat> and we'll go over a little bit of why I, uh, I say four and a lot of other groups choose three. But uh, the first three here in this list are the kind of the big three, the ones that everybody agrees on, right? Descriptive, exploratory, and explanatory. Descriptive research is really just, as the name suggests, describing the world, right? How much crime is happening in the United States? That's descriptive research. Um, you know, what percentage of all scientists are women? That's descriptive research, right? And this is, this seems relatively simple uh, on the surface, but trust me, it gets a lot more complicated really, really quickly. Um, exploratory research is for kind of new areas where there's not a lot of existing research. Um, this is just kind of, let's go in and kind of sort of figure out what questions we need to ask, right? Uh, there's been so little research about this subject or about this group of people or about this thing that we really don't even know enough to ask really good questions yet, right? And um, I have this memory of being an undergraduate criminal justice major and um, taking a, a, a directed study where I was supposed to read a bunch of these different books and do book reports um, about these kind of great works in criminal justice history. And one of the choices, and one of the ones I ended up choosing, I forget the name of the book, unfortunately, but it was this amazing book by a researcher uh, back, I think, the 90s, early 2000s. Um, and she had read um, journal article after journal article after journal article about street gangs, but street gangs... Street gangs were incredibly male-dominated, obviously, as almost all street gangs in American history have been. And she really wanted to know, but what about the kind of the female, not necessarily official members of the group, because again, most of them were male only, but, uh, you know, the, the wives and girlfriends and sisters and mothers of all these gang members, how do they kind of fit into this gang dynamic and and you know what are their lives like and so she went and she studied with these female kind of 
essentially gang members, even if they weren't official. Um, and it was just a really enlightening book that I really, really enjoyed. And that was exploratory research. And there's explanatory research. And explanatory research is, you know, very simply can be expressed as does A cause B or is X correlated with Y, right? You get at least two variables. You have some reason to believe that one is influenced by or causes is caused by the other. And you want to test that to see if it works, right? Does increased police patrol reduce crime? Um, does uh, educating uh, workers about internet safety reduce cybersecurity incidents, right? Um, but you are explaining the relationship between two variables. Now, that fourth one, which I have set out as its own fourth category, is often put as a subset of explanatory, and that's evaluation research or applied research, right? And with evaluation research, um, you, you as a researcher are kind of hired or um, uh, otherwise engaged by some outside group, and they say, hey, we want to do a thing. Uh, I, or we've done a thing, would this be a good thing? Would it be effective? Or is this thing we already did effective? Or of these four choices, which one will give us kind of the best bang for our buck? You know, um, So evaluation research might be, you know, uh, charities in third world countries might say, hey, we want to improve uh, the life expectancy and health of these very incredibly poor people living in this impoverished nation. Uh, how could we best spend our money to most improve the lives of the people we're trying to help? And you might be hired to go in and say, well, this works, this works, this didn't work, um, or this might work, this probably won't work, etc., etc. But that's all uh, evaluation research, which again is, is often kind of lumped in under explanatory, uh, but I've pulled it out as a fourth category of research <clears throat> because that's the way I learned. Now, there are lots of different ways you can do descriptive research or explanatory research or exploratory research or whatever. And we're going to talk about each one of these much, much more in depth later. But there's experiments, which have a bunch of requirements in order to be called an actual true experiment um, where, you know, Often in a lab setting, you control for everything except the one variable you're trying to gauge the impact of. Uh, quasi experiments, which are similar to experience, but experiments, but lack uh, at least one of the uh, the requirements to become a true experiment, which makes them a little less um, scientifically rigorous, if you will, but still incredibly useful and still very important. Um, because sometimes it's just physically impossible, either due to the nature of reality or uh, legal or ethical requirements to do a true experiment. Probably the most common kind of research design uh, in the 21st century is the survey, which we'll talk a lot more about. And I'm sure everybody watching this video has uh, taken at least one kind of survey, right? Phone survey or an internet survey or some kind. <clears throat> There's participant observation where somebody kind of goes and lives amongst some group uh, in order to observe how they interact and what they do and what their lives are like. So the, the book I mentioned on the last slide about the that uh, researcher living with the female uh, gang members or associate gang members, uh, that was a participant observation or, or some kind of observation uh, research design. Um, intensive interviewing, um, this is where you... Uh, an interviewer sits down with an interviewee for uh, a good, nice, long, in-depth interview. Uh, one of the most famous cases here was uh, Alfred Kinsey, who way back oh, before I was born in the mid to mid-late 20th century, uh, studied human sexuality and was one of the first in the Western world to really do a scientific analysis of human sexuality and became very famous and wrote a couple of books and but he would do these intensive interviews with tons and tons of different people from all walks of life to learn more about what's normal and what's not normal and 
and um, you know what's not being talked about and and um, uh, with the you know the the cultural taboo especially at the time of human sexuality and then of course there's secondary data analysis and secondary data analysis uh, is one of my favorites because it requires less work than the others um, but basically secondary data analysis is kind of just what it says you take the data that some other researcher has gathered and use their data for your own analyses right because there's mountains and mountains and mountains of scientific data that gets collected every year by people from all kinds of different disciplines. And um, there's a requirement that if you take any, I am not a lawyer, so I might be getting the details here wrong, but it's something like if you get any federal money or any state money or use any government resources for your research, when you're done with your data, you have to submit it to this group called the ICPSR. And I don't remember off the top of my head um, exactly what that acronym stands for. But it's a giant database of research data that's housed at the University of Michigan, I think. And they have it online for anybody to use. Uh, you can go right now and just Google ICPSR and go to their website and you can start looking at these just mountains and mountains and mountains of these huge data sets um, that you can download and run your own analyses on um, if you understand how the data was gathered, what exactly each variable was measuring, all those very important things, which hopefully the data has a, a code book with it and, and some literature that you can read to really understand this data that you're using. But you can kind of skip the whole gathering data step because that step's already been done for you. You just have to find it, familiarize yourself with it, and then you can go right to the data analysis part. And when I wrote my dissertation uh, to earn my PhD, I used this secondary data analysis from some previously collected data. Uh, it was a giant, um, uh, uh, huge survey of uh, prisoners in both state and federal prisons uh, and they were asking, I mean, there was hundreds of different questions that each one of these prisoners answered. Um, and of course, I was only interested in, in five of those. But as far as I know, I was the first person to at least attempt to answer uh, my particular research question using this giant data set uh, that was gathered by somebody else. Now, another way to split up research <clears throat> is quantitative and qualitative and this is a little tricky this is a little um uh, uh difficult to define difficult to really draw a nice sharp line between but in essence quantitative research is research that has nice clear easily measurable easily quantified variables like um reported auto thefts that is very easy to put a number on right qualitative is much more of like what alfred kinsey was doing with human sexuality where you get these giant mountain of interview data and you have to kind of sort through that and figure out what counts as this variable and what counts as that variable um because you know people can essentially say the same things but with very different words, right? So, you know, in a qualitative interview, somebody might say, oh, I was the victim of a sexual assault. And somebody else might say, oh, I was raped. And they are telling you the same thing, even though there's not using the exact same words. So you're, you have to kind of figure out that, oh, those two things are either exactly the same for your purposes or close enough that we're going to group them together or, or whatever um, but so quantitative is very very easily counted and numbered and quantitative research usually has really large sample sizes lots of numbers big Excel spreadsheets whereas qualitative data you usually have a lot more information about far fewer subjects you tend to have much smaller samples but each member of your sample gives you a much larger amount of information that you have to then kind of sort through and and categorize <clears throat> now 
So the previous types of research, the exploratory, explanatory, descriptive, and evaluation, uh, we can, you know, usually fit these into quantitative versus qualitative categories. This is not perfect. You know, there's lots of times where this is not true, but in general, uh, descriptive and explanatory research tends to fall into the quantitative areas, whereas exploratory research tends to fall into the qualitative areas. Um, but not always, you know, there's, there's all kinds of different, um, uh, uh, methods of doing each of those different kinds of research. So you might find a really great explanatory study that uses qualitative research, right? Um, and then for the processes we talked about on the previous slide, the surveys and the interviewing and all that stuff, those also tend to cluster in either quantitative or qualitative, right? So things like surveys and secondary data analysis and all those things tend to, to be quantitative research, whereas things like the intensive interviewing and the participant observation tend to be qualitative research. But again, there's huge amounts of overlap here. Huge amounts of overlap. It, it can be really difficult to take a look at a study and say, oh, that's clearly quantitative or that's clearly qualitative. You know, most research probably has at least elements from both. It's really difficult to find a study that's 100% one or the other. Um, so there's often, if not the majority of the time, really distinct elements of both quantitative and qualitative research uh, in any large research project. Now, one thing that's very important <clears throat> is to triangulate use multiple different techniques, multiple different methods to measure your variables and answer your questions because that will absolutely help um, make sure that you're measuring the correct things and doing the right things and getting good data in order to help uh, make sure that the answer to your research question that you come up with is the best possible reflection of reality. So. The more methods you can use, the more variables, uh, the more different measures you can use for each variable, all that stuff, the better. You want to use more of these, not fewer, if you have the time and money and energy, etc., etc. Now, we're trying to find the truth, right? We're trying to find reality. We're trying to find fact with a capital F, right? If you go into a philosophy course, you'll find that it's not really that easy to determine what truth with a capital T is, right? So there's kind of two different schools of thought. And again, I am not a philosopher. So this is going to be pretty much an overly simplistic uh, description of these two concepts. But uh, the two kind of big competing overarching groups of theories that are kind of trying to answer the question, what is truth, are positivism and interpretivism, right? And positivism says there is some objective reality outside of any human experience that it is our job to kind of discover and find and measure. Whereas interpretivism says, not really. All we have is human interpretation. All we have is uh, reality as seen through the lens of being human. And thus it's really the human factors and the human point of view and the human biases and the human experience that can inform what truth really is, right? <clears throat> and again, if you want to learn more about that, find a philosopher, because I am most decidedly not a philosopher. Um, but in research methods, we talk a lot about uh, uh, truth, but we're looking less at the philosophy of it and more at the validity of it, right? Are we doing our research 
in such a way that it minimizes biases and error and problems that will prevent us from getting as close to truth with a capital T, however you define it, uh, as we can. And when it comes to validity, again, this is something I've seen taught many different ways in many different textbooks, but this is the way I learned it, so it's the way I'm going to teach you. But there are four large groups of validity issues. There's, there's four kind of categories for validity uh, that research methods has to be focused on. That's internal, external, construct, and statistical, right? The one we're going to talk the least about is statistical validity. Uh, that basically boils down to, are you using the proper statistical techniques and are they doing what you think they're doing? And we'll leave that for a stati statistics course. Uh, in fact, I probably won't mention it again in this class. We are going to focus on internal, external, and construct validity, right? And internal validity is essentially, if you find a correlation between two variables, is that actually reflecting reality? Is, is X causing Y? Or is there some other reason why X and Y might be seem to be related in your data? External validity is the simplest of the three that we are going to be talking about. And that's just, uh, does the conclusions you're drawing from your study in your sample translate and does it equally apply to other people's places and times? Because if I do a sample of voters in the state of Tennessee and ask them about what issues are important to them, that might not translate well. You know, any conclusions I draw from what the voters in the state of Tennessee have to say might not translate that well to California or Vermont. And it might not also translate to uh, people in... Uh, uh, you know, Tennessee in 1920, right? So how, how well can we apply our conclusions to other people's places and times? And then there's construct validity, which is essentially, uh, and we'll get much more into this later, how well are you measuring what you think you're measuring? If we want to know how much crime is occurring and we're using the uh, Uniform Crime Report from the FBI to gauge how much crime is happening, is that really an accurate measure of how much crime is really being committed? And of course, as you should all know by now, the UCR only records reported crime. So all crime that doesn't get reported to the police doesn't show up in that number. So we might have a problem with construct validity if we use the FBI's UCR data uh, to measure how much crime is, is happening in the United States. All right, that is the end of this section. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.